defining love. Let's look at the various forms of expression that love is finding, first of all. For most people in the world, love is just a mutual benefit scheme. Okay. <laughs> people have different kinds of needs, physical, psychological, emotional, social, financial, so various types of needs. To fulfill these needs, I love you is always a good mantra. Without that mantra, many doors will not open for you. <laughs> so that's one level of thing. But fundamentally, what is this that we're calling as love? <clears throat> Somewhere, the way the human being is right now, no matter where he is in his life, no matter what he is, what he has achieved, somewhere there is a sense of insufficiency. It's not enough the way he is. The way he is right now is not enough. He wants to include something else as a part of himself to make himself more complete. So love is a huge longing to include the other as a part of yourself. If this longing to include the other as a part of oneself, when it finds an emotional expression, we are calling this love. If this longing to include the other as a part of yourself finds a basic physical expression, we call this sex. If this finds a mental expression, it gets labeled as greed, ambition, whatever. All these are just efforts to include something else as a part of yourself, isn't it? That which is not you right now, you want it to become you. This is the longing of love. So, it is just an emotional expression of the same longing which, is co which a human being is constantly longing for, to include something else as a part of himself. This starts from gathering simple things around him to seeking spirituality or God, the same longing to include something else as a part of himself. The fundamental longing to have a larger slice of life than what you have right now. That is a longing, isn't it? Somehow the way it is, is not enough. You want to experience life little more than the way it is right now. So this longing to include the other as a part of yourself is love. Emotionally, how much ever you make this effort, you get close to that. You are almost there many moments, but next moment it falls down. It doesn't matter how intensely you approach it, you will see you are almost there and it falls apart. You are almost there, it falls apart. So, it gives you a taste of oneness but never establishes you there. So, love is just a vehicle for oneness. What you are longing for is that oneness. Emotion or love is just one more vehicle to get there. But uh, it is a vehicle which takes you close to the other bank and turns you around. Close to the other bank and turns you around, never lands you there. <laughs> so, when you get sufficiently mauled by the process of love, you will be ready for grace. What is called as grace? <clears throat> Anything that I say will be misunderstood. <laughs> Because what is not logical and physical cannot be put into language. <clears throat> if we want to use an analogy, gravity is one aspect of life. We are sticking to the planet right now because of gravity, otherwise we would be floating all over the place. We have a body today only because of gravity, otherwise we couldn't gather this body itself. So gravity is one aspect of life which in a way is related to the fundamental instinct of self-preservation in a human being. There are two basic forces within you which are constantly functioning which seem to be in conflict with most people. It is not in conflict but most people see it as in conflict. One is the instinct of self-preservation which compels you to build walls around yourself to protect yourself. Another part of you is longing to constantly expand. One is trying to build walls, 
another is trying to expand. The walls of self-preservation that you build for today are the walls of self-imprisonment of tomorrow, isn't it? Isn't it so? Many limitations you establish in your life as a protection for yourself. Tomorrow you feel they're imprisoning you and you want to break it and build a bigger prison for yourself. But day after tomorrow the same big prison feels like a restriction and you want to break it and go to the next stage. So these two longings, one is to preserve yourself, another is to continuously expand. These two things are not opposing forces, these two things are related to two different aspects of who you are. Self-preservation needs to be limited to the physical body. It's only your body which needs to be preserved. Everything else can be mauled and demolished and rebuilt every day. Every day in the morning you can actually get up and build a whole new personality if you want. But right now, your instinct of self-preservation has extended itself to the very way you think, feel and understand life, isn't it? All the time you're trying to protect that. But self-preservation should be limited only to the physical body. Only the body needs preservation. Everything else can be reshaped and recreated as you wish, any moment of your life. So these two forces, because they are in conflict or they seem to be in conflict, there is a whole problem about all these things that we need systems and systems to see, speak spiritual processes. If only, if one's instinct of self-preservation, one learns to keep it just within the body and not extend it to other aspects of life, every human being in the planet will be naturally spiritual, will naturally get to his ultimate nature. Only because he is restraining it, because his instinct of self-preservation always tells him, this is not safe, that is not safe. Only body has to be preserved. Everything else is open to everything else, isn't it? That's how it should be. But right now, the way you think, the way you feel, your values, your morals, your ideologies, your religion, all these things need to be preserved. Now, in this, there can be no expansion. Suddenly, there seems to be a conflict. So if we have to use an analogy, gravity and grace, let's put them as opposites. Gravity is trying to hold you down. Grace is something that is trying to lift you up. This is only an analogy because grace cannot be explained that way. If you are released from the physical forces of existence, then grace bursts forth in your life. It is not that grace has to come, you know, always in your calendars and pictures you saw grace is coming as a few rays of light and reaching a particular person. It is not so. As gra gravity is active, grace is constantly active. It is just that you have to make yourself available to it. With gravity you have no choice, anyway you are available to it. But with grace, you have to make yourself receptive and available to the forces of grace. So all the work, Whatever kind of spiritual work you do, whether you do prayer or puja or asana, pranayam or whatever you do, ultimately you are just working towards making yourself available to the force of grace. Because without grace you won't be lifted up. Which way you approach it depends upon what you are exposed to, what kind of a person you are. But whatever you are doing, you are just making yourself fit enough to be available to grace. Inner beauty? If you have the right kind of eyes, everything is absolutely beautiful. <clears throat> relative thing is a social factor, again, it's a training. It depends on what kind of data has gone into your mind. When you're unhappy, only certain things are beautiful, certain things are ugly. When you're very happy, you look at anything, everything looks absolutely beautiful. See, there are many ways to look at this. One simple way is, right now you may be identified with many things, starting from your physical body to your mind, to your education, to your religion, to your society, to various things that you hold in your life. But when you simply sit here, 
If you simply sit with me right now, you are just a piece of life, isn't it? A certain amount of life energy, that's all you are, isn't it so? Identified with many, many things, but fundamentally you are just a certain amount of life energy. So this life energy which, I, which you call as myself at this moment, this life energy sometimes has been very joyful. Has it been? Has it been? Please say yes, otherwise it's tragedy. <laughs> sometimes it's been utterly miserable. Sometimes very peaceful. Sometimes turmoil. Sometimes agony. Sometimes ecstasy. This has happened to this, isn't it? So this life energy which you call as myself is capable of all these things. So if this life energy is capable of all these things, if you were given a choice, what kind of expression your life energy should find right now in this moment, what would you choose, agony or ecstasy? Definitely ecstasy. So if there was a conscious choice about how to keep your life energies right now, definitely you would have kept yourself absolutely joyful and ecstatic. Only because a large part of you is happening unconsciously, other things which you do not want are happening within you. What you do not want is happening in the world. You cannot stop it hundred percent. Only to some extent we manage these things. But within you, you are the only ingredient. In the world there are a million things. See, if we want to create a situation the way we want it, we need the cooperation of hundred people around us. All of them will never cooperate hundred percent. They will all play the game that way, isn't it? In any given situation. Even if you are just two people in the family, you cannot have the situation 100% the way you want it. Yes or no? This is the reality with the outside. But with the inside, you are the only reality. Nobody in the world happens your way. At least this one person must happen your way, isn't it? But right now even this person is not happening your way. That's why you are asking what is the way to joy. Your mind is not happening the way you want it. Your body is not happening the way you want it, your emotion is not happening the way you want it, nor your life energies are happening the way you want it. We need to do something about it, isn't it? If all these four are happening the way you want them, you would definitely be joyful every moment of your life, isn't it? Irrespective of what's happening around you. So we need to explore the technology. Because it's a subjective technology. Because the ingredient is you, it's about you. Unless we create a certain atmosphere of commitment and focus to look beyond certain things that you're identified with right now, it will not be possible to explore this. The reason why the spiritual sciences, especially in this country, which was so rich in the mystical traditions, has become so ridiculous is people try to do it anywhere and everywhere without necessary committed atmospheres. So the whole what we refer to as a spiritual process is just this, that in your experience you create a distance between you and your physical body, between you and your mind. These two accumulations, you learn to use them well, but you don't get identified with them. The moment you're not identified with these two, you will not be identified with anything. You can play your game whichever way you want in the world, but you will not get entangled. The reason why people are afraid of involvement in life, you know always the so-called spirituality has been talking about detachment, detachment. Why are they talking about detachment? Because you're afraid of involvement. You think if you get involved you'll get entangled. People have generally known only entanglement, not involvement. Without involvement there's no life, isn't it? Can you experience anything without involvement? Can you really experience anything? Whether the food that you eat or the people around you or the life around you or art or music or whatever in your life, can you experience it without involvement? No involvement, no experience, isn't it? Where there is no involvement, there's no possibility of any depth of experience in your life. But people have been always telling you detachment because they're afraid of entanglement. Entanglement has come fundamentally because you are identified with these two accumulations which you call as body and mind. Because of that, wherever you put your hand, it sticks to you. Wherever you put your hand, it sticks to you. 
So people are telling, keep away. If you want to keep away from life, you just have to fall dead. It's very simple. Why stay alive? It's very interesting what you're saying because uh, what you're saying is that we've always heard detachment. That seems to be always the objective. And you're saying something very interesting that unless you become involved, you're, you're almost... No, it's involved. not my statement. This is life, isn't it? Can you know life without involvement? From your experience of life, you tell me. Where there is no involvement, there is no possibility of life, isn't it? So if you want to stay away from life, why are you trying to be alive and stay away from life? This fall dead, your objective is fulfilled. So this whole detachment nonsense came up because people are afraid of entanglement. And this possibility of entanglement has come because you are identified with something fundamental which is not you. Once you are identified with something that is not you, everything sticks to you. Wherever you put your hand, it gets stuck to you. So because of this experience, people are talking detachment. Fear of involvement has come. But if you avoid involvement, you will avoid life itself. I don't think it's fear of uh, involvement. I think it's more of, you know, not wanting to be hurt. And you get yourself... That is the fear of involvement. No, not, not, not fear of involvement. You say you stay away from, you try and detach yourself, you know, to the material world or to even to love your own siblings or your wife or your children, that you don't, you don't do it with an expectation. When you, uh, when you get attached with an expectation, then there's bound to be hurt. The involvement is very necessary, I agree. But yet, you know, it's not, detachment is for a specific purpose to evolve to a higher state and get rid of the things which burden you in life. I look at more in that way. Yes, that is the understanding that by being detached you won't get hurt. So, when I say fear of involvement, it's just that. If you're involved, you could get hurt. If you're involved, you'll not get hurt. If you're entangled, you get hurt. It's the entanglement which causes pain and suffering, not involvement. Because people cannot distinguish between involvement and entanglement. They don't know how to draw a line between, between what is involvement and what is entanglement. Uh, a simple blatant solution seems to be detachment. But detachment is not a solution for life. It's a way of avoiding life, isn't it? So where do you draw a line between involvement and entanglement? I'm sorry? So where do you draw the line between involvement and entanglement? Yes. <laughs> now, uh, I am telling you, what is the basis of entanglement? The fundamentals of entanglement is, you are identified with things that you are not. The moment you are identified with something that you are not, entanglement is inevitable. Wherever you put your hand, it will stick to you. There is no other way. If you sit here now, in your experience, not in your thought, in your experience, if it's clear cut within you, your body sits here, your mind is out there, what is you is away from this. If distinct separation is there from this, would you get entangled with anything in your life? Only because you are attached to this body, you are entangled with this body, you get entangled with every body. If you are not attached and entangled with this body, you will not be entangled with any body. You can throw yourself into anybody's life with total involvement without the fear of entanglement. If anybody sits with me for two minutes, I am absolutely involved with their life because there is no fear of entanglement. If I am afraid, if I talk to this person and get involved, suppose if this person does something else tomorrow, will I be hurt? If this possibility is there, I would hesitate to involve, isn't it? If there is, an in, they, there is a possibility of entanglement and pain attached to it, Definitely you would hesitate to involve. When there is no fear of entanglement, that is when you would throw yourself into everything, isn't it? Are you trying to understand how a human being should move forward and get back to the old ways rather than the materialistic ways? Now, this is very contradictory. You are talking about moving forward and old ways. See, with the distance of time, everything that is old looks nice today. We are talking about old ways. If the old ways are brought in today, 
totally into our society, into your lives, would you be really happy? Is it true? I mean, it's not the real, it's the core values that he's advocating. See, that's what I'm saying. Why, ha why are we, why are we sticking to some values? Fundamentally, because there is no consciousness, there is no inner experience. Yes? Why, why do you, see, if your humanity is in full flow, this moment, why would you need values? Why should I tell you, be good to this person? If your humanity is fully active this moment, do I have to teach you, please be nice to this man, don't kill him? Should I, do I have to tell you? Only because you are identified with something and just suppress the basic humanity in you, now we have to tell you, please don't kill this man, be good to this man. Okay, he is some other caste, some other creed, but please be good to him. This kind of teaching is necessary simply because we have suppressed the basic nature within us. If your humanity is in full flow, at that moment nobody has to tell you what is good and what's wrong. wrong. Anyway, you will be fine. See, all values and moralities have come into the social sphere only because the inner dimensions have not found full flowering. Because the interiority of a human being does not find full expression, somehow it is suppressed by various means. That is when we have to teach people what is right, what is wrong, what is okay, what is not okay. Now the whole process of whatever Rumi is about, whatever spiritual process is about, what we call as yoga is about is just this. The word yoga means union. Union between what and what? Now, this whole idea of the individual and the rest, me and the other. This fundamental experience of right now, me and the other, is the basis of all the conflict in the existence. Isn't it so? There is something called as me, there is something called as the other, which is the basis of all conflict. This me and the other can get extended to groups of people, communities, nations and various types. But fundamentally, me and the other is the basis of conflict in the universe. Is it so? So what is me, what is not me right now? Right now, what are the things which you call as myself? Your thoughts, your emotions, your body, your ideas, your philosophies, this is what you call as me, isn't it? All these things you accumulated from outside, it's not you. If your experiences, if your experience of life transcended the limited accumulations that you have made in your life in the form of body, in the form of thought, in the form of emotion and ideologies and philosophies and values, then there is no such thing as me and you and there would be no conflict. So the whole aspect of yoga or spiritual process or whatever room is outpouring in a very passionate way is, <laughs> is to bring about this experience that if you sit here, there is no such thing as you and me. It's all me or all you. For one moment right now, for one moment, if you experience all these people who are sitting here really as a part of yourself, after that, do I have to teach you morals and values? Be good to this person, don't harm this person, don't kill this person. Would it be necessary for you? Would it be necessary for you? No only because you have created a false sense of identity about yourself. Now we have to teach values and values. At no time in the history of humanity, all the people have had the same values. Always one person's values and the person sitting next, the values are different. Never in the history of humanity have all the people had the same values. Is it so? Is it so, Baba? No, that is fine. Now, is it a reality that never in the history of humanity, even within a family of two people, two people don't share exactly hundred percent the same values? Is it true? So if I stand by my values and you stand by your values, conflict is inevitable. This is the basis of conflict. See, see, all this will help as long as you, the situation doesn't go into your corner. You can dialogue as long as it's not gone into your corner. When the situation gets really pushed into your corner and your values are really threatened, you will become violent. When what you believe in is threatened, you will become violent. Isn't it so? What do we do to overcome that? 
That we will see. First, I want you to see this. The basis of conflict in the world is your values. Because you have one kind of value, somebody has some other. See, right now the conflict in the world is not between good and bad. One man's belief versus another man's belief. Isn't it so? So these are the values. The values are different and people are constantly fighting. So if you want to go beyond this, if you want to live here without values, then your consciousness has to flower, your humanity has to find full expression. If you begin to experience, even for a single moment in your life, if you start experiencing these people, how you experience the ten fingers of your hand, after that I will… I don't have to teach you any values or morality about anybody. That which you have known as yourself, with that you have no conflict, isn't it? The conflict is always with the other.